And then I told somebody about it. And my whole goddamn life came apart. It was, you know, it was unreal. I had no uh, real problem as far as getting jobs, as far as with relation to my epilepsy at all. Epilepsy has a way of sapping your confidence. I don't know why, but I've seen it happen time after time to person after person. You find that about easily 50 to 60 percent of the people can't even begin to spell the word epilepsy and far, far do not even know how to understand it. People with epilepsy is biggest very often is not their disorder itself. It is more public's attitude, people's lack of awareness about what epilepsy really is. Does epilepsy scare you? Are you afraid of someone who has epilepsy? If you have epilepsy, how do you tell people about it? What do you do if someone has an epileptic seizure? If you're an employer, have you ever turned someone down for a job simply because they have epilepsy? And is fear of epilepsy unreasonable? If you've asked these questions or had these fears, you're not alone. Tonight on Oregon Diary, we'll look into the myths, fact, and fiction regarding this often misunderstood disorder. We'll try to reveal the truth and dispel fears through understanding. Later in the program, we'll be joined by two guests, a doctor and someone who has epilepsy, who will talk about living and working under the shadow of epilepsy. This and more in the next hour. Stay with us. Tonight's documentary feature is entitled The Fine Line. Produced by Tony Fetters, Heidi Brownson, and Kim Irwin, and narrated by Robert Sturdivant, this is an in-depth look into living and working with epilepsy. This feature defines epilepsy and dispels some of the myths about it. Now, The Fine Line, Epilepsy in the Workplace. And then I told somebody about it. And my whole goddamn life came apart. It was, you know, it was unreal. I had no uh, real problem as far as getting jobs, as far as with relation to my epilepsy at all. Epilepsy has a way of sapping your confidence. I don't know why, but I've seen it happen time after time to person after person. You find that about easily 50 to 60 percent of the people can't even begin to spell the word epilepsy and far, far do not even know how to understand it. Each of these four people has a disorder known as epilepsy. It's not a disease, it's a disorder which affects over two million people in the United States. These people range from ordinary citizens to legislators in Washington, D.C. So what makes them different from other people? People with epilepsy must overcome barriers that many of us will never have to face. These barriers exist in all aspects of their lives, from education to marriage to employability. The employability of people with epilepsy is a complex issue. Put yourself in the position of the employer. Why should employers hire someone with epilepsy? What will people think? What will happen if they have a seizure on the job? Will they be reliable or look for special treatment? Employers are concerned about job performance, stress, safety, and customer relations. Would you hire a person with epilepsy? Would you have these same concerns? Now put yourself in the position of a person with epilepsy. Your needs and wants are just like everyone's. Your family looks to you for support. Your contribution to society is vital. You know you could do the job if only given a chance. People with epilepsy are frequently denied jobs as a result of misconceptions about epilepsy. These misconceptions stem largely from misinformation, myths, 
and ignorance. Once the truth about epilepsy is understood, the barriers will no longer exist. People with epilepsy's biggest barrier often is not their disorder itself. It is more public's attitude and people's lack of awareness about what epilepsy really is. Who decides which jobs people with epilepsy are capable or not capable of doing? The employer, the doctor, or the person with the disorder? There's a fine line between safety and discrimination, between employability and non-employability. Within the next half hour, we will explore this fine line that affects all of us. We will talk with doctors, employers, and persons with epilepsy, as well as people who work to help place them in the job force. We will explain the different types of seizures and discuss the treatment options currently available. But first, let's discuss some of the major misconceptions about epilepsy. Many people think the word epilepsy is synonymous with violent, thrashing seizures. But these types of seizures only constitute 30 to 40 percent of all epileptic seizures. Many seizures are so subtle, they often go unnoticed. It's a common belief that people with epilepsy can only work certain jobs. People think that jobs with a high safety risk are completely beyond the capabilities of people with epilepsy. Some jobs from which they are understandably excluded are pilots, truck drivers, and train engineers. A seizure while performing one of these jobs would endanger the lives of others. Yet, there is a wide range of jobs available which do not involve such risks. The biggest problems in the workplace involve around exposure to machinery or sometimes getting up on, on high places, uh, ladders or something like that, or up on a scaffolding. Basically a place where if they had some alteration in consciousness, where they, they uh, perhaps would move in a fashion that is unplanned or would lose consciousness and actually fall, where they could hurt themselves. The employer feels that people with epilepsy will require special treatment to perform their jobs. If you walk into a job interview and say, hi, my name is Reed Hansen, I have epilepsy, unconsciously or consciously, the scales slightly slip. While certain accommodations may be necessary, employees with epilepsy, for the most part, can perform their jobs without need for intervention. In many cases, however, a large gap in employment history is construed to mean unreliability or a lack of motivation. I've gotten depressed thinking that I'm not capable because I have something wrong with me and my answer to that is to sit and read books and uh, drive my wife insane by not going out and looking anymore because I got tired of filling out applications. Employers do, however, have very real concerns such as safety, reasonable accommodation, and workman's compensation. Money plays a significant role in these concerns. Employers worry about paying higher insurance rates if they hire a person with epilepsy, when in fact, these rates are not formulated by the types of people working, but on the type of work being done, as well as past claims filed. The primary factor is the nature of the business and the history of that business regarding claims that have been made. Under reasonable accommodation provisions, employers are required to make reasonable changes in the work environment to accommodate handicapped individuals. Again, money enters the picture. Assume for a second a uh, situation where the employment is on the uh, third or fourth floor in an old building. Uh, you know, is reasonable accommodation to require them to put in an elevator if the person's in a wheelchair? Reasonable accommodation does not mean wholesale changes in the business structure. An employer will not be asked to go to extreme expense in order to accommodate one individual. The expectations are proportional to the size of the business as well as the needs of the individual. Safety is also a valid concern for employers. Accidents will occur on the job and employers may feel that people with epilepsy have higher accident rates. But is that actually true? They don't like to admit it, but uh, the safety rate for epileptic is around 85% better than other people. And why would you say that is? Well, because the epileptic is concentrating on the work they're doing. They're not concentrating on thinking of, on, about other people all the time. They're working very hard to get the work done. More often than not, the employer's claim of concern for safety is used to mask the ignorance of the truth about epilepsy. But what exactly is the truth? Epilepsy is a physical condition caused by sudden, brief changes in the brain's electrical activity. When brain patterns are disrupted, a person's consciousness, movements, or actions may be changed for a short time.
In simpler terms, your brain is like a well-conducted orchestra. Its different sections act like the brass, strings, and woodwinds in an orchestra. Individually, they are just a bunch of instruments playing a series of notes, but together they form a beautiful melody. Now suppose the brass section keeps making mistakes. The rest of the orchestra is playing correctly, but one section is playing the wrong notes. This ruins the entire melody, at least until the brass section starts playing correctly. Something like this happens to a person with epilepsy. A part of their brain plays the wrong notes from time to time. This is called an epileptic seizure. There are two basic categories of seizures, generalized and partial. Generalized seizures involve the entire brain, while partial seizures involve a specific portion. Within each category, there are two different types of seizures. The generalized seizures are tonic-clonic, formerly known as grand mal, and absence, formerly known as petit mal. The partial seizures are simple partial and complex partial. The generalized tonic-clonic seizures basically seem to involve some of the very deep central structures of the brain and then have an almost instantaneous spread of the abnormal electrical activity to involve the entire part of the brain. The tonic-clonic seizure is what is most commonly associated with epilepsy. The most visible signs of a tonic-clonic seizure include unconsciousness and stiffening of the muscles, followed by convulsive movements. The other common generalized seizure is the absence seizure, which does not involve a fall. It is characterized by brief interruption of awareness and perception. Partial seizures involve a specific portion of the brain. These include complex partial and simple partial seizures. Usually they actually start from the very front or the inside surface of the, uh, of the brain in the temporal lobe region. In part that's felt to be because these are protruding out and the area of the skull right next to that is relatively sharp and that the numerous instances of trauma that all of us have may lead to formation of scar tissue here or over here. And it's particularly common in people that have had uh, automobile accident or significant head injury. These often do not resemble what we would generally think of as a seizure, but rather inappropriate behavior. You may, for example, ask them a question, and their answer to the question may not be uh, appropriate. For example, you may say, where are you? And they may tell you their name. The other partial seizure is the simple partial seizure. A simple partial seizure is uh, a focal onset seizure without impairment of consciousness, usually with a single symptom, which can be uh, uh, a impairment of motor function or uh, twitching of one arm or one leg or the face. Standard treatment for most types of seizures is regular use of anticonvulsant drugs. Treatment with anticonvulsants has dramatically changed the kind of life that people with epilepsy can expect to live. For hundreds of thousands of people, these drugs have meant the difference between a fearful, isolated existence and a confident life based on the knowledge that the chances of having a seizure are small. People react individually to drugs just as they do to other substances that enter the body. One person may experience side effects while another person will not. Depending on the type of drug involved, the most frequent side effects are drowsiness, irritability, nausea, overgrowth of gum tissue, or physical clumsiness. Although there are many anticonvulsant drugs, the most highly used are Dilantin, Tegretol, and Depakote. The most commonly used drug for epilepsy is Dilantin. Uh, Dilantin has been available for 50 years now and has really helped control uh, epilepsy in a large number of people. Its most common side effect, uh, if you are in the higher dose levels of the drug, is a loss of balance and coordination. They started me on 1,000 milligrams of Dilantin a day. I couldn't lift my body off my couch, almost literally. I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't carry a conversation. I couldn't tell you what show I was watching as soon as a commercial came on. I couldn't be able to tell you what I was watching. Dilantin basically suppresses the seizures. I haven't noticed anything else from that particular medication. Uh, second drug would be Tegretol, uh, which is another commonly used medication that's been available for perhaps 10 to 15 years. 
Uh, that drug is used primarily for the generalized or sometimes the partial complex seizures. That drug, uh, the major side effect of that, uh, again, is a sensation of imbalance. It tends to take higher dose levels before the imbalance uh, is evident. My medication uh, does make me a bit sleepy. I will say that the, if I had to pick a side effect, sleepiness, I think, would be, would be the biggest side effect. The third most commonly used drug is a drug called Depakote or, or Valproate. Uh, that drug uh, uh, has very few visible side effects. There are some people who may feel uh, tired on the drug. Uh, mainly we're worried more about hidden side effects affecting your liver, uh, sometimes some blood forming uh, side effects as well. Although side effects are prevalent among these drugs, most feel it's worth the discomfort in order to control the seizures. Probably at least 80% of uh, people uh, on anti-epileptic medications, when they're properly used, uh, achieve good seizure control. Now that they've finally got me under control and seizure-free, I will gladly stay on medication if it means not having seizures. For those who do not achieve good seizure control through the use of drugs, surgery is a viable alternative. Epilepsy surgery has become more prevalent in recent years. Sandy Berg was a prime candidate for surgery because she suffered from multiple daily seizures and could not gain seizure control with her medication. Within the last decade, uh, surgical uh, treatment of epilepsy has become a major uh, alternative. Uh, it is not a treatment of last resort. Even though these medical treatments are effective, a large percentage of the time, seizures do happen. Unfortunately, most people don't know what to do when in the presence of someone having a seizure. But people tend to overreact. They tend to try to restrain the person who's having a seizure, try to jam something into their mouth to prevent them from swallowing their tongue. When in fact, people who have seizures don't swallow their tongue, they just, uh, they may have some changes with breathing and have some impairment of breathing. But what should be done in the event of a seizure? Basically allow the seizure to happen. So uh, try to protect the individual put a pillow under their head or uh, uh, protect them from hurting themselves. Uh, it's been generally best not to try to put something in the individual's mouth. Many people with epilepsy do not get the chance to tell employers or co-workers what to do in case of a seizure. This is because they chose not to disclose their epilepsy when first applying for the job. The decision of whether or not to disclose their epilepsy is a big issue. If they disclose and then don't get the job, they wonder if the epilepsy was the reason. Judging by the problems many of them face getting jobs, they have good reason to fear this discrimination. Many don't consider their epilepsy a hindrance to performance on most jobs. Therefore, they see no reason to mention their epilepsy on the application form. This is especially true for those suffering from absence or simple partial seizures, which often go undetected by casual observers. Most of the people that I know do not tell employers when they first walk in on the first interview that they have epilepsy. And they find that 90% of the time, they get a job a lot faster. A person who suffers from tonic-clonic seizures has a bit more difficulty. Many people with tonic-clonic seizures still don't disclose in order to secure a job. But what if a person doesn't disclose epilepsy and later has a seizure on the job? I feel that those who do not disclose at all are gonna run into a risk of some uh, problems of being dismissed from a prospective employer in case they did have a seizure at, on the job and it did create a, a bit of a problem, then it would be a rather embarrassing situation for them. Many decide that it's getting the job now that matters. Some decide to take the chance on disclosing once their job is secure. Still others decide to keep their epilepsy hidden in hopes that they will not have a seizure on the job. This is often what leads to problems. Employers and co-workers aren't prepared to deal with a person having a seizure. When I've had seizures, I've always told the people that I work with closely that I, what to do, how to do it, and what to expect. If a person does not disclose their epilepsy and later has a seizure on the job, the employer often uses the fact that the person lied on the application as a reason for dismissal. This covers up for the fact that they do not want to employ a person with epilepsy. Even if they have a seizure disorder, but it's 95% controlled by medicine and they haven't had one during the daytime for five years and they don't anticipate having one on the job, uh, 
I am not going to condemn somebody because they hide that personally. I'm not going to condemn them because they hide it from the employer because otherwise they run the risk of not getting the job. Disclosure remains a personal issue. Often disclosing or not disclosing means the difference between working or not working. Even if they decide to disclose their epilepsy from the start, there's often another barrier to hiring. Many employers require a person to drive, even if the job itself requires no driving. Employers often insist that a person have his own transportation. This usually stems from a fear that without transportation, a person will not show up for work reliably. The epileptic person does have another hoop they have to jump through because they have to show, more than perhaps anybody else, that they're going to be able to maintain control of that vehicle. A person with epilepsy whose seizures are not fully controlled by medication is not able to have a driver's license. The Department of Motor Vehicles stipulates that a person with a seizure disorder must have a doctor's approval to get a driver's license. Those who are ineligible for a driver's license because of their epilepsy find this an added barrier to job hunting. Before I got my license last November, on the application, frequently employers ask, do you drive? And if I put no, you know, that, that application was out. Driving is become a very big deal. I work a swing shift right now, and I don't have a bus available at night, so I have to pay for a cab to take me downtown to catch the very last bus. So I spend one hour's worth of pay every day just to get home. And that's, that's really a killer on your paycheck. Even when I would try and explain to them how extremely comfortable I was with the public transit system and could get you know, just about anywhere, still driving was a, was a real barrier to employers. In addition to problems getting a job, this often has psychological ramifications. Driving and owning a car is regarded as a status symbol. Telling a person he can no longer drive is often a blow to his self-esteem. Driving has become so commonplace in our society that an inability to do so is regarded as unusual. Despite this, some are willing to give up their driving privileges in order to avoid the possibility of injuring themselves or others if they had a seizure while driving. I read a small little article in the newspaper that somebody had a seizure and drove into somebody else's house and killed two members of the family. After that, I take the bus. Because many people with epilepsy cannot drive, they must become adept at using the public transportation system. One organization that helps orient them to the system is TAPS. TAPS, the Training and Placement Service, is the division of Epilepsy Association of Oregon. It was established in 1976 under a U.S. Congress Commission study on the high unemployment rate of people with epilepsy. It was originally established as a youth employment program then concentrated its efforts on adults. There are currently 14 TAPS offices throughout the U.S. TAPS goals are to provide support and guidance to those with epilepsy who have had a hard time finding jobs. They provide orientation sessions, workshops, and job-seeking skills training. They also provide weekly support with the job club. Individual counseling and appointments are also available to those who need them. TAPS provides the encouragement, the confidence, the little push, maybe, that I needed. Although TAPS helps many people, it's not able to help everyone. Some people, due to the specifics of their cases, do not benefit as much as others. I didn't go out looking for handouts. I didn't want somebody to give me something for nothing. I didn't want any free things. I didn't want anything. I wanted guidance. One thing they haven't been able to provide is some of the financial support like they have been able to do back in 1977 which they did job placement more directly at those days. This problem stems from lack of funding. Even if they can't help everyone who walks through their door, they do the best they can with the resources available and do provide a valuable service. We serve people who are primarily job ready. There's obviously some people that, that aren't able to in, do an independent job search, for example, would need someone to go with them on an interview. Um, you know, and unfortunately, our program model doesn't allow us to be able to go out and do those kinds of things. Job Club is weekly sounding board for people with epilepsy who are struggling to deal with their disorder while at the same time trying to find a job. The group is led by Stephanie Seely of TAPS. Groups meet informally to discuss job problems and learn better job seeking skills. 
These meetings not only provide information, but are also an outlet to help vent their frustrations in a relaxed and supportive environment. Once a person with epilepsy gets a job, they still have many problems. For example, they must deal with co-workers on a day-to-day -day basis. Co-workers don't know what to expect. They may realize that the person next to them has epilepsy and that it could affect their job performance. They may feel that the person with epilepsy will not be able to perform their jobs completely and this will force an extra workload upon the co-workers. Most people have problems keeping up with their own workload, let alone having to help out others who may become incapacitated at any moment. But this doesn't always have to be a problem. My co-workers are extremely supportive and I have a slight memory problem, short-term memory loss, and they are extremely patient in repeating instructions if it takes two times. But should a co-worker be responsible for helping out with a person with epilepsy? Should a co-worker take the initiative to understand his co-worker's condition? Should the co-worker be told if he is working with a person with epilepsy? What kind of atmosphere will be created if a person with epilepsy is let into the workplace? Will the staff be helpful or turn on him? Those who don't understand the disorder often turn away from the person simply out of fear. I'm all of a sudden I'm a, a black sheep or something, you know, and don't touch him, you can catch it. Literally at work, a few people thought that I could catch it, or they could catch it from me. This isolation often produces stress. Stress. It penetrates all our lives, especially on the job. It is a major factor in a person with epilepsy's life because he is faced with extra stress sources. When will I have my next seizure? What do my co-workers think of me? What if I lose my job? I try not to get myself um, as stressed out as, as I could if I did let, let myself go. And so I, I catch myself saying, wait a minute, you're getting all tense or something, and, and it, it helps me to relax. There is probably nothing more stressful than not being accepted by your peers. If a person with epilepsy has a seizure on the job, or if his condition is misunderstood by his co-workers, then his relationship with them could be deeply scarred. The biggest threat is that people are going to find out, and then you're working real hard to make your job go, and you're physically tired, and then you're worried about whether or not you're going to have a seizure, or how long it's going to be before you do have a seizure at work. You know, and then by then, have you established yourself enough at your job, and will, that, will anything count? Once the trust of the peers is lost, it is hard to get it back. They also worry about losing the trust of their employers. Employers worry about losing the trust of their customers. Customer relations are a big, big barrier, such as sales. If you're operating in a sales position and you have a seizure, your manager tends to think that the customer won't come back in again. Uh, I've had people fired from restaurant jobs as a waitress because of fear that they'll somehow pour hot coffee in a customer's lap if they have a seizure. And if they have frequent seizures, that's, a, that's a, a genuine concern. There is a liability concern for someone with frequent seizures. For someone who has controlled epilepsy, that shouldn't be a problem. Employers in any situation should be concerned about how their company appears to customers. Their employees' behavior reflects on the company itself. An epileptic seizure is not delinquent behavior. It is a medical disorder. If an employee were to have a seizure in the presence of a customer, the employer would simply have to explain to the customer that his employee has epilepsy and this in no way affects his ability to perform his job. Despite all this, people continue to be discriminated against because of their epilepsy. Laws to help in the removal of discrimination have evolved over the years. Before the 1970s, epilepsy wasn't even recognized as a handicap. Now that it is, discrimination laws protect those persons with epilepsy who, before then, did not receive equal treatment in the workplace. Within the last decade, specific cases concerning epilepsy have been decided in the nation's high courts. The struggle for equality in the workplace is beginning to turn in favor of those with epilepsy. For example, cases such as School Board of NASA County versus Arline, Reynolds versus Brock, and Mantolit versus Boger have bolstered the awareness of discrimination against people with epilepsy in the workplace. How do people with epilepsy feel about their disorder? Do they consider it a major barrier to living full, productive lives? While most consider it a problem in some areas of their lives, it's the attitude of the other people towards their epilepsy which causes most of the problems. I don't want people to believe that it is something to be afraid of. And if I explain to them what it is, then maybe it won't be so fearful. 
People aren't as afraid of saying the word diabetes as they are of saying the word epilepsy. Yet, in many ways, the two are very similar. Each could involve a loss of consciousness if the person misuses their medication. Yet the word epilepsy has a stigma attached to it, which diabetes doesn't. Perhaps it's because epilepsy is a disorder of the brain. People often assume that any brain disorder goes hand in hand with psychological disorders. This could not be further from the truth. You've already met some people with epilepsy. Except for their medical problems, they're just like you. People who have epilepsy simply wish that people would accept their disorder for what it is and accept them for what they are. They're not epileptics. They are people with epilepsy. And like you, they want to work. Understanding that a person with epilepsy is not disabled or unable to work in the job market or unable to <clears throat> be a person. They just have a slight handicap. I've often encouraged others who have the same disability at different degrees to be real positive about their job search and hang in there because I know they can probably do it. But even with a positive attitude, jobs are still often hard to come by and some employers aren't willing to take a chance on a person with epilepsy. An employer who doesn't understand epilepsy may not be open to hiring someone who has the disorder. People with epilepsy's biggest hope is to increase awareness among the general public about what epilepsy really is. Increased awareness would bring increased understanding among potential employers. A person with epilepsy is only unable to perform if they are kept by the, the workforce out of the workforce. So what can we do? How can we remove the stigma that people with epilepsy must face every day? It's not going to happen overnight. But slowly, with increased awareness, perhaps attitudes can change. But maybe they can't. The choice is yours. Hopefully, we've revealed some of the myths and misunderstandings about epilepsy. When we come back, we'll be joined by two guests who will discuss what it's really like to live and work with epilepsy. They'll also give us some firsthand insight into the way society views and treats people with epilepsy. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Oregon Diary. We're joined by Dr. Richard LaFrance, a neurologist from Corvallis Clinic, and by Rick Long, who knows about epilepsy firsthand. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Dr. LaFrance, I'll start with you, and I'm wondering, is the public's perception of epilepsy different now than, say, it was 20 years ago? Uh, I think it's only changed a, a small amount over the last uh, two decades. Uh, it's always difficult to tell exactly what the population thinks about anything because people, I think, change their mind on a daily basis. But I'm not sure that there's been a, an awareness of uh, epilepsy, uh, how it really affects patients, and about the number of different things that can be done for it medically. Why doesn't the general public know more about epilepsy? Uh, again, it's very hard to say. Uh, perhaps it's because it's one of those diseases that people don't talk about all the time. Do, do you think that in the next 10 or 20 years that it will become a more prevalent disease as far as public knowledge is concerned or will it remain the same? I tend to think that as a recognition that there's more that can be done for it medically and, and the recognition that actually there are a lot of people that have epilepsy that are, are perfectly functional, are, are totally normal uh, except they have to take medicine regularly. People will realize uh, the tremendous advances that have been made in that disease, and some of the old prejudices that have been there will fall away. Mm -hmm. In the documentary, we kind of drew a, a line between epilepsy and diabetes. Now, my question is, if people aren't afraid to say that they have diabetes, which is in similar to epilepsy in that you have to take medication to control it, why are people afraid to say that they have epilepsy? 
I, I think that the perception has been out there, which is not correct, that diabetes has been cured with insulin because diabetics have, still have a lot of problems. Uh, the perception is out there that uh, people with epilepsy can't be helped, which is equally incorrect because there are lots of things that get done for people that have epilepsy. Uh, it's hard to say exactly why there's a difference. Epilepsy's had a, a mystical treatment over, over its, if, if it's, uh, as long as people have known about epilepsy. Uh, there have been periods when people that have had epileptic seizures have been thought that, well, perhaps they're being uh, visited by, by God or uh, it's a very religious experience that uh, you know, upon recovery from a seizure, uh, this person might be able to make some sort of a prophecy so that uh, there have been periods where people that have had epilepsy have been looked up to and have thought that they had something more to offer. There are other periods in our history, and these are perhaps the more recent ones, where people with epilepsy were looked down upon, that when people had seizures, uh, they were put away. And it was, it's really only uh, 30 or 40 years ago when there were what are called epileptic colonies, where people that had epilepsy uh, were kept before there were good drugs or effective medications people had epilepsy were sent there mm -hmm. and it was a, a type of a state hospital system that luckily doesn't really exist anywhere anymore. Okay, we'll get to you in a sec, Rick. I got one more question for the doctor here and, and before the show we talked about epilepsy and, and you deal with uh, numbers of about 500 or more mm -hmm. uh, people with epilepsy. What's the general makeup? Is there any? Uh, I think it's a, a broad spectrum of the population. Uh, the most people that I have that have epilepsy are uh, fully functional, normal people who you would not be able to tell from your next door neighbor. They're nor they, they, everything is fine. Small percentage of people have had brain injury of some sorts, and uh, one really sees the stigma of that type of brain injury, be it a trauma from an automobile accident or some other thing that might have occurred in childhood. Mm -hmm. Most of them are very normal. Mm -hmm. Now, Rick, you have epilepsy and you have to deal with it on a daily basis, and my question is, how aware are you of epilepsy? Is it something you're constantly thinking about? Are you thinking about it sometimes during the day and not others, or do you just think about it when you have an attack? I think about it only in regards to my medication that I take once a day. Other than that, it doesn't affect my daily life at all. Mm -hmm. What is an average day like for you? Hectic. I manage a transmission shop, and I deal with customer service and managerial skills and actually a day as normal as anybody else's day that I know of. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about your medication um, and we discussed the, the various kinds in the documentary. What are you using and how do you feel it helps you? Does it help you? At this time I take Dilantin and I have had to control my seizures. It seems to really help quite a bit. We had to get an adjustment stage to where it really worked out into my favor and then once that was settled it would, it's very consistent and I have no problems with it at all. And how many times a day do you take it? I take my medication once a day. Once a day, and how much of a dose? Is it fairly large? I take 500 milligrams. Is that a lot, or...? It depends on the degree. In my case, apparently, it's not a lot. Mm -hmm. Other people have to take a larger dose. And with my case, that is sufficient for my level. Mm -hmm. Let's say you lost your medication for a day. What would happen? I would get a sick feeling, but other than that, if I had my medication knowing it would be coming, I guess the anxiety would be gone too. Mm -hmm. Knowing that I wouldn't be there and where would I get my next medication in would be a worry. That's when I'd start having concerns. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is also is what changes occurred in your life specifically? Now you went along for a while, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. with epilepsy and either maybe thinking you had it but not really f officially knowing you had it. Yes. What happened in your life and to the people around you, your friends and the people you worked with when you were diagnosed with epilepsy? I was 28 when I was diagnosed as having epilepsy. I suspected all through my life. I was treated as one person one day. I had to go back the next day and tell them I was a different person. And it didn't seem right to have to do it that way, but that's how it was perceived. And people looked at me as a different person and treated me as a different person. So you saw your friends and coworkers true colors? Actually. Yes. Yes, I was ostracized. How many of the people that were your friends and coworkers before you told them this are still your friends and coworkers today? 
Very few. How many? Could, you know, Actual number, about five. Five, so you have actually five true friends, huh? Five true friends that stood by me and supported me. Now, are you in the job, same job now as you were when... No, I'm you, not. What, what was people's reaction when you told them? Are these people that you went out and, and had beers with and, you know, oh, and yes. went to watch football games or oh, yes. that We'd type of thing? we gather after school for pool tournaments and have a beer after work. Mm -hmm. And once I disclosed that I had epilepsy, I was, I don't know what their, what their ideas were. I don't know if it was their ignorance of the unknown or whatever, but they looked at me as a totally different person. And I got the impression that these people thought they could catch it from me. Mm -hmm. And I actually had one individual ask me that. Mm -hmm. Dr. LaFrance, what is a person's initial reaction when he or she is told that, yes, indeed, they have epilepsy? Well, I think that when you tell somebody that they have epilepsy, there's a lot that goes on with it. Um, for a couple of minutes, you may tell them uh, they have epilepsy, and that's a word. They don't know what mm -hmm. the word is. There's a lot of education that I have to provide, uh, and sometimes the, through the Epilepsy Association in Portland, they get some booklets to read. Because it, there's an awful lot more to epilepsy than just that one uh, word. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think part of the prejudices that you've met up with are the things that uh, one has to deal with right in the beginning. There are people who, when you tell them that they have epilepsy, it's a relief because it's nice to know what has been going on for a while uh, can be understood and dealt with. But then sometimes there are people that when you tell them they have epilepsy, it brings out some of these fears as to, to what's going on, what might happen into the future. Uh, and maybe some something uh, of experiences from their own childhood or other people that, in the distance that they know about or only vaguely know about, so that this brings out some of the prejudices about mm -hmm. epilepsy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I've never had anybody really worry too much about catching it, but I know there are a lot of people out there that are worried about what is going to happen. Every once in a while you, you uh, have a feeling that, uh, you, you, that somebody thinks an epileptic is going to turn into a murderer mm -hmm. or some sort of a criminal or uh, something else like that. Uh, that's which is certainly not true. That's very interesting. I don't think that's true at all, but mm -hmm. you have a feeling that it's not just a disease, mm -hmm. that it's a, it's a whole construct of how they think this person's behavior might change. And one has to, when, when you first meet with, some, with somebody or after you've done some tests, uh, electroencephalogram, you've made the diagnosis, this mm -hmm. is epilepsy, you're trying to talk with a patient, uh, there's a lot of give and take about what I can tell somebody at one point in mm -hmm. time. Well, why, don't, why don't we stop there, there, and when we come back, we'll okay. ask you how you tell someone they have epilepsy. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Oregon Diary. We're with Richard LaFrance, a doctor, a neurologist at Covalence Clinic, and Rick Long discussing epilepsy. And when we left off, doctor, how do you tell someone that they have epilepsy? Tell them face to face. Tell them start right off the bat that, you know, we have uh, what I believe is an explanation for your problem. You know, tell, give them the word epilepsy. And then I'll move ahead and very rapidly. Uh, say that there are lots of things that we can do for this to help control this problem. Because I think that's the thing that immediately comes to mind is what am I going to do about it? Bring into control issues about how there can be medications and things are going to be helpful. Then I'll move back a few steps and start talking about what epilepsy is in regards to some of the biology that we've talked about or that has been presented in the documentary previously about the abnormalities of brain waves and brain cells and things like that, and sometimes about the causes of it. But I rapidly want to get into uh, the thought that this is treatable, controllable, and that they should be able to live a normal life with, uh, with help. Mm -hmm. Rick, what was your reaction when you were told? I was relieved. I was relieved to find out I didn't have a brain tumor or some dire medical situation that I was going to be able to cope with. Mm -hmm. I had suspected, and I finally had found out, I said I was relieved. Mm -hmm. I was informed I had a seizure disorder, though. The word epilepsy wasn't brought up without questions being asked. You know, exactly what kind of disorder do I have? Um, mm -hmm. What caused it? And it was, I was told it was a gray area. And being the fact that it's not really that much known because epilepsy is in the brain. Mm -hmm. 
And so I was on the assumption, like, well, okay, I'm taking this man's advice, and I'll go along with that. A seizure disorder, I blacked out. I feared I had epilepsy, so I went ahead and accepted that and told myself that I have epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And seizure disorder was another term for it. It was mm -hmm. a cover-up word for it, I figured. Now, you say you were 28 when yes. you found out. How long a period of time did you go from thinking you had something wrong until you found out for sure? About 10 years old, until I was 28. What was the first incident that led you to think that I, I, might, have a, I might have a problem? blacked out in a class in grade school one day. I was sitting at my desk and fell over. Mm -hmm. uh, I had it again happen. When I was younger, it was not frequent. The older I got, the more frequent they got. I would be sitting in class. I would just black out, totally fall over. I wouldn't have the convulsions. And I would start to get to the point where I have one a month. Mm -hmm. And I would get a warning, a feeling that I would have this coming on. And I could usually hide it from people. I could sit down and concentrate this on before something. you were on medication even yes right. okay I could uh, sit down and concentrate real hard and I call it writing it out so mm -hmm. people didn't know what I was doing sitting right next to them mm -hmm. and that seemed to work for a while mm -hmm. and as I said the older I got the worse they got and gradually then, progressed then. yes when was your last seizure and what was it like my last seizure was November of 88 and I don't remember what it was like I blacked out mm -hmm. I have no recall of what happens it takes me generally 15 to 20 minutes to get my full function back I don't lose control of my body functions as I am disorientated very severe mm -hmm. so you're very in control of it then and mm -hmm. frankly not not too worried about it as long as you take your medication you're gonna be fine yes right? exactly my question was going to be then a lot of people with epilepsy might fear that the disease could kill them in some way. And I was going to ask you, it seems that you have it pretty under control, but is that in the back of your mind that, that this is a disease that if someone's doing a dangerous job and they have a seizure that they could kill that, themselves? Yes, potential is always there. I had my driving license, driver's license excuse me, uh, revoked because of this situation until they felt that my medication was established into my system and it was returned to me. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they informed me that they thought it might be a, a hazard to my condition, so that was acceptable with me. But yes, the potential is always there. Uh, walking down a flight of steps could mm -hmm. potentially fail if a person were to have a seizure and go down. Um, there's no 100% guarantee, from I understand, of totally controlling, but roughly to 85 to 75% control over that. Mm -hmm. Dr. LaFrance, is there any problems at all for people with epilepsy not taking their medication for any reason? Well, obviously, uh, the return of the seizures is a problem. Uh, the biggest problem with seizures are they're in, uh, unpredictable. They could occur when you're going down the steps. They can occur when you're in the bathtub, when you're swimming, when you're riding a bicycle, when you're in some other uh, normal activity, and uh, the fall that might occur with a seizure is often hazardous. Seizures themselves, if prolonged, and they may become prolonged if medication is suddenly and abruptly stopped, can be life-threatening and people can die from seizures themselves, mm -hmm. although that is uncommon and usually is in association with other problems. Let me ask you this, uh, just a quick question. Is surgery a good option for a good amount of people with epilepsy or do you try to discourage it? Uh, well, I do not try to discourage it in those people in whom it's definitely indicated, and that appears to be people with certain types of seizures from certain areas of the brain that are accept, uh, accessible surgically and who can't tolerate uh, the high levels of medicine that might be necessary to control their seizures. Mm -hmm. uh, within that group, I think that it's very appropriate and have encouraged some people to have surgery. As a general rule, however, I do not encourage surgery, and I don't think people would in somebody who is otherwise well controlled on medication because the surgery does involve removal of part of your brain, mm -hmm. some normal tissue as well as abnormal tissue. And what rather, are the side effects? What major area of the brain? It'll depend on what part of the brain is involved. I see. But uh, it may most commonly affect some of the areas responsible for memory and some types of, uh, of the, the integrated thinking or language. Mm -hmm. Rick, pr that probably wasn't a major consideration for you. 
farthest thing from my mind. I mm -hmm. had not the inkling of idea that surgery was even considered for epilepsy to mm -hmm. this point. 30 seconds. What's an average day? An average day is to go to work and start with my phone work to deal with customers, do service writing, order parts for my mechanics, and maintain an office flow of coherent information for my customers, my boss, and my mechanics so I have a routine that's set. Mm -hmm. Basically, a very normal life then. Yes. That's great. Well, thank you, Dr. and Rick. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and shedding some light on epilepsy, a uh, disorder that not many people know about and uh, that we need to learn more about. We'll have a quick preview of next week's show after this. All of the documentary work shown on Oregon Diary is original work by Oregon State University students in the Broadcast Media Communications program. However, next week's is a special show. It's one of the first complete documentations of alternative medical treatments in the United States. These practices are what mainstream American medicine once called quackery. Now these treatments are redefining balanced medical practice. We'll be joined by a woman who has been cured of cancer through one of these new techniques. Next week, mind your own health. Laughter is the best medicine. That's all the time we have for this week on Oregon Diary. Hope to see you next week. Thanks for joining us, and good night.